Hi, Kitty Cats. Today on the show, I am joined by a very special guest. I will be speaking with Kevin Dorman of Prismatic Speech Services. We're going to have a discussion on how gender and gender identity are developed, and then I hope to contrast our views on gender with our observations of how gender is understood by the general public. I also want to wish a very happy birthday to my sister, Lara. Love you, sis. All this and more on the Dingbat Diaries for the week of August 10th, 2023. Quick shout out here. I am Amethysta Herrick, your hostess for the program. All of my work is supported by subscribers to my Substack publication. So if you like this content, please go to Substack. Feel free to subscribe. It will be linked in the show notes. Subscribers, when you subscribe, you will receive emails every time I publish new content, and you're also able to interact directly with me through Substack. That's a real benefit, trust me. You will also receive a subscription to the Identity and Gender Theory website that I will be launching later this month in August. Okay, well, let me turn to the star of the show here, Kevin Dorman. Kevin, first of all, thank you so much for agreeing to to interview with me, to do a Dingbat Weeklies with me. Oh, of course. Thank you so much for having me. It's it's going to be a new thing. All of the ones I've done, all three of them, or four, I don't know, have just been me prattling, and, and now it can be the both of us prattling. Perfect. Well, I know that we can both can fun. go on and on, so this will be, be perfect media. Yes, I hope everybody <laughs> has cleared their calendars, because <laughs> it could go a little late. So... On, on that note, so if anybody tuned in last week, and some did, you may remember I discussed a conversation actually with Kevin, <clears throat> and I think I spoke about that conversation um, with you, Kevin, for 40 seconds. I think it was 42, Yeah, which was kind of neat. It was like the conversation of life, the universe, and everything. But in 42 seconds, I was capable of misgendering you twice, and I wanted to offer you a very sincere apology for my rude behavior. I appreciate your patience, and I appreciate you for correcting me. Oh, thank you. Absolutely. And I mean, thank you for the apologies. We we all make mistakes, right, in terms of misgendering other folks and even ourselves. So um, the least right. I can do is offer you the same grace that I hope other <laughs> folks give me when I make mistakes, right? It's a good point. Thank you. That's that's a great uh, a great conclusion to come to, especially given we want to talk about gender today. Um before I ask you any questions, because I got some, before I ask you anything, could you just do a quick introduction, um, you know, to, to your, you know, yourself and, and your work? Um, yeah. Tell me what, tell me what you got. I'd be My, I knew, to. I knew a guy, sorry, this is a prattling. I knew a guy when we would do interviews, um, we'd go in there and, and the person would say, all right, tell me who you are and why you're here. <laughs> Which is great when you have like this imposing, you know, Canadian guy. Can you be imposing in Canadian? <laughs> Apparently. We got the evidence. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and and candidates would be like, oh, shit, I don't know. Why am I here? I thought you called me, you know. <laughs> so anyway, Kevin, please tell me who you are and why you're here. Sure. Um, like you said, my name is Kevin Dorman. I use they, them pronouns. Uh, live in Greensboro, North Carolina. Uh, lived in the South my whole life, um, growing up sort of in a, uh, the liberal bubble of Chapel Hill, as it were. Um, so thankfully had, you know, a good amount of, of uh, queer and, and even trans exposure, like in, in high school and whatnot. Um, had an extensive relationship with my own voice developed through singing, voice acting, mm. stage acting, um, uh, pretty much any, any vocal medium that I could put my hands on when I was growing up. Um, and, uh, became a speech language pathologist as I went to grad school, uh, seemed like a, a, a good usage of my passion for, for vocalization. And, and I took an intro class and just got hooked. Um, let's see, that was in t 2009. Um, oh boy. yeah, six years later, uh, graduated from grad school out of rural North Carolina, which was its own thing that we can get into. Um, and uh, started up my business, Prismatic Speech Services, which almost solely works with the transgender community, uh, providing gender-affirming voice work and any other speech-language pathology services that trans folks uh, require or want. Sure. Um, 
to help folks experiment with their sound and sort of figure out what they want to do with their instrument. Right. Right. It's great work too. Uh, clar- to clarify too, you founded Prismatic, right? This is, it's yeah. all yours. Yeah. It's okay. my business. I opened it up seven years ago, first only Lovely. serving North Carolina, then expanding to Virginia through Georgia um, Ooh, okay. for myself. Now I have yeah. several contractors and we serve about 15 U S states total with plans to expand that to about 30 or 35 later oh this year. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Let, please. I will certainly say thank you. I mean, this is, it's hard. <laughs> I wrote an article, I guess, um, the months ago now, I think it was in January. So it's been a long time, but voice is for, at least for me, voice was the last thing to change in my social transition because, you know, the way at least I put it in the article is that communication is one of the, that's our big outward facing I mean, this is what we really present to the world. And I mean, I could go to a market or something, a, a store, and and probably pass. But there was a, t- I mean, January anyway. N- now I don't have a whole lot of trouble. But in, in January, February, um, I could go to the store and and if as so long as I didn't talk to anybody, you know, it's okay. But when I came home, my, I mean, I'll use the word presentation, because my presentation to my family was still the old person. Yeah. Because communication is just so personal. Absolutely. And it's also necessarily like directed toward other people, you know. 100%. It's always fascinating to hear how people find their way to voice work because we get all sorts mm-hmm. of different people at different points in their transition. Um, I'm curious because I know that voice is so integral to, to your life. Um, was it in terms of your own transition, was it, uh, did you prioritize other aspects of transition first that felt more pressing or, um, was voice intimidating? I'm just kind of curious. You know, it's a great, that's a really good question. Do, well, let's, we can switch. You start <laughs> hosting this, will you? I don't... <laughs> Thank you for joining um, me, Amethysta. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Um, it was, it was, I mean, your question was, was it, you know, was it, was it difficult? And the quick answer is no. I mean, I started talking to a speech pathologist. So is it, what is a speech and language pathologist? Is that if we, if we want to put the SLP? full stank on the title? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. So I started talking to an SLP. There we go. See, look at that. I just, right. Um, I think it was like September of last year. And <clears throat> like you, I, I was a singer when I was younger, and I also always loved doing voices. I loved doing accents. I loved doing character voices. Oh, yes. So, so you know, I was capable of, of – I knew how to change aspects of my voice, but I didn't know – like, I didn't know them consciously. I don't know how better to put that. Oh, yeah. So much of what I did was, was learn conscious control of, of resonance and everything – Resonance, pitch, you know, um, inflections, everything that you do for a feminine voice. But your question, which was not, I'm not answering, was, was it difficult? And yes, absolutely. Technically, no. No, I, I, I picked it up fairly quickly. Personally, yeah, really, really hard. This is why I ended up writing, a, you know, this article where I was just like, how do I... Because it really becomes who you are, who you represent yeah. to the people around you. And for some reason, I was okay wearing a skirt around everybody, but I wasn't okay sounding like Amethysta. Mm. So it was hard. So I don't know if that answered your question well, but... Uh... I mean, I think it was a great response. And, and I think it really gets to the heart of why this work is tricky beyond just the basic tricks of, you know, modifying. Uh, right. I, I think that vocal play is, is a great place to start. Like we, I mentioned my voice acting background. I'm always delighted yeah, right. when clients have sort of a playful relationship with their own voice coming in. Cause that makes yeah. the skill acquisition so much easier, but there's still right. that internal core question of, all right, now how do we use this to craft who we are and what we want to convey to everyone else? Sure. Sure. Because you you could have worked, I mean, I know, you know, a possible, 
I think target's not the right word, a possible client mm. of SLPs would be, you know, children, children who have, you know, difficulty with whatever, you know, however expressing something. Forgive me, I'm not an SLP, clearly. Um, hopefully I said that you okay. Great. But, uh, thank you. <laughs> um, what, was it, what was it about transgender and non-binary people in particular that you wanted to, to put your focus on, turn your spotlight on? There's so many, so many reasons. Uh, for one thing, I feel speech language pathology is, is thankfully a, a very broad uh, degree, a very broad focus, because you're right, we can work with kids in elementary schools or middle schools and mm -hmm. even high schools. Um, we can work in hospitals, we can work in skilled nursing facilities, uh, so many different applications. Uh, and I think one thing that I, I didn't anticipate being sort of demoralizing about all of these different places is that oftentimes you work with clients who don't really want to be there. They're either told sure. to go there by their parents or they were, you know, operating at this level of capacity and then due to a stroke, they're at this level of capacity and it's a really hard road back to where they right. want to go. Um, but with trans clients, it's all people who want to be here, who say, yes, like this is something sure. that I want to get done either for myself or, or you know, for my, my ease of, of movement throughout the world. Um, mm -hmm. And it's just really nice to work with people who want to work with you. Um, and I think uh, another big piece is, you know, being in community myself, um, I, I started learning about gender affirming voice work when I was learning about my own gender identity, which is to say around like sure. 19 or 20. Um, okay. A bit of a late bloomer compared to some of these youngsters and whippersnappers these days, but... No. Um, so same here. I was 19, 20, 21. Right? So. There's only so much you can do until you learn the terminology and have more exposure to different ways of thinking. Sure, sure. Uh, well, and, mm -hmm. and this was like the late Jurassic era for me. So like the terminology <laughs> didn't even exist. Right. Sure. We were just kind of like, shit, watch out for the Tyrannosaurus Rex running <laughs> towards us, you know, <laughs> lift up your skirts to do it. So, you know, but fire good. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um <laughs> But yeah, and I think as I as I looked around at the current research and and uh, uh, services being offered, particularly in North Carolina, mm -hmm. it seemed like there were a lot of folks falling through the cracks, um, a lot of people putting forward fairly, I would say, ultimately harmful ideas about like gender and presentation. Mm. Um, sure. And and it just it it boiled my blood a little bit, and I said, "There's got to be something better that can be done." Um, yes. additionally, like voice services are often available in, uh, more, uh, urban areas, more developed sort of like cities, not so much rural areas. Um, and in undergrad, there were trans women traveling, you know, two hours to come to the school's oh, clinic shoot. and then two hours oh back. Oh my gosh. Yeah. 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 This was pre pandemic. So like telehealth mm -hmm. and whatnot was not nearly as big of a thing. Um, right, right. And so I said, there has to be, a, you know, a smarter way to do this to serve people who can't take four hours out of a day to travel and right do all this. So, um, you know, serving serving rural trans people was was uh, a big core component and tenant of prismatic yeah. since the beginning. Yeah. Do, you know, you said something that never like never kind of hit home because you mm. you mentioned um, people who might have had a stroke. Uh, needing to needing to to build back up their their skills, it's interesting to me because I you know you said was it difficult for me to do voice work, and and the technical aspects were were not, but the but the personal aspects were huge. It's interesting to think like that was, I mean that's the whole same thing you just talked about. Yeah, you know there there are children and there are there are you know adults. The, the they don't want to start it because it means you know it means changing the way they communicate or that you know it's an indication their communication is 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 difficult so absolutely I, um, it's funny i i thought it was just my problem <laughs> <laughs> no so i mean so many folks like and and it's so interesting because the vast majority of people really go through life without really thinking about how we speak or how we communicate to other right. people 
Um, right. It's only by going through a process like this or, or public speaking classes or, or you know, any mm-hmm. sort of voice centered uh, training that we start to learn about all of these different components and how malleable they actually are. Right. Right. Oh, yeah, I know. <clears throat> it's fascinating to me. There are people, um, you know, people I've seen on the Internet who. So it's probably true. Right. <laughs> I, I think, think so. if you see it on the I Internet. Think that's safe. Okay. <laughs> use wikipedia a lot i think that's probably accurate <laughs> but there are people i mean i'm i'm fascinated in seeing people who can do a very very like i mean can sing a sing you know bass line uh you know i don't forgive me now i'm screwing that up i even know music what in the world <laughs> but people who can sing in you know a baritone type voice and then and then switch to a soprano i mean it's fascinating to me the amount of control that we can gain over, you know, a very small part of our body, Absolutely. really not even a big one. So, and I really love um, people like that because it really breaks down these like categories of that we tend to think are not, yes, not flexible, right? Right, um, right. So much in terms of singing is like you are a baritone, you are a soprano, you are these things. Right. When actually, yes, no, yes. you can learn so much more than that. Yes. Yeah, it's amazing. Um, I, I'm trying to remember the, uh, there's an acapella group, which is not coming to me right, right now. I wish I could remember what it was. The, I actually, the first thing I ever saw was, um, do you remember that uh, that one movie, Brother, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? Oh, yeah. Thou? George Clooney Man movie. Man of yeah, Constant Sorrow. Yes, yes. The, there was an acapella group that did. It was the first thing I ever saw by the, by them. I'm going to find them. I'm, I'm going to link this, that video. Because I saw that guy later on on like America's Got Talent or something, and he was singing this very, he always sings very low. And then he hits, I mean, something really high that I'm watching the video. I'm like, that's not, is that, that is him. <laughs> I'm like, Jesus, because you, you can hear the, 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 the tonal qualities in his voice. It's just the pitch suddenly went really high. And I went, holy cats. Incredible. That's amazing. Yeah. It, it, yeah, really. Um, you had so we've kind of gone back and forth on the idea that you know the the voice so the voice starts here but it must go outward i mean you know it is necessary we use our voice mostly for communication even with music mm-hmm. you know even you know we're still singing as a form of communication um i want to talk just a little bit about about development of gender sort of period if we could, I'd rather sort of think about um, transgender and non-binary people at the moment. But I mean, I want to, I want, I want to ask your your opinion. I mean, like, what part of gender do you think? I mean, first of all, let's let's think about external uh, parts of gender. What, what do you what do you think we develop as part of gender that is external? It came out poorly, but go with it. I mean, there are so many different influencing factors on who we are, even from moment to moment, right? Like, I, I mm-hmm. think that as we sort of develop this, this sense of self, surely there are external factors that influence uh, what we feel like is even possible. Um, there are, you know, gender norms that we're all thrust into. There's socialization as usually X or Y. Z is usually not a part of the equation. <laughs> sure. Um, and, you know, in that sort of development of the self, we are we are often told what we should do. Um, sure. And then in that development of self, many of us, you know, push against sort of those expectations, either just in terms of gender norms or in terms of deeply felt like sense of self. Uh, Mm -hmm. So it's always sort of a a negotiation, I feel like, between sort of external and internal forces. Yeah. What role do you think gender dysphoria plays in that then? Yeah. Uh, We're getting into the the thick of it now, because like, what is gender dysphoria at the end of the day, right? I I got a theory, but or not theory, but yeah, I've got an idea. But no, I'd love to hear yours first, please. Well, I think I think a lot of gender dysphoria has to do with um, how we are treated based based on sort of what others perceive. Um, 
I, I do think, I, I mean, I've heard from trans folks that like, you know, even if we were in a complete societal vacuum where there were no societal forces, they would still feel gender dysphoria. So there may be something innate there. But I also think that that is such an extreme, far hypothetical, so far removed from our experiences right. that it's hard right. to truly say what we would feel in that scenario. Yeah. So I feel like it's got to be a lot of like social contract of like, I, I view myself as, as this, but I'm being treated differently. And why is that right. the case? Right. Yeah. I love, I love the use of the word negotiation because I, I think, I think of, of, Gender as a process. I mean, you know, Absolutely. you and I have talked about this, but gender is a process of negotiation between who you really know you are and kind of what your society, the so, uh, socio-environmental factors will allow. And I want to use the word allow somewhat in quotation marks because it's like, in some cases, like say rural South, um, like, I didn't express certain things because I went to graduate school right in Georgia. Mm. And, and Athens, Georgia was, you know, probably better than, than other places. It was definitely better than other places <laughs> in Georgia. That was 1994 that I went there. So, I mean, it was, you know, expressing different, you know, expressing myself. There were, there were times I honestly feared for my safety, yeah. you know. I'd put on a hat because I had very long hair. Put on a hat because I didn't want to go somewhere and have somebody go, well, let's take this person out and do whatever. I don't even want to keep going on that. Same here so, in grad school in rural North Carolina and shout out mm -hmm, to Western Carolina yeah. university, but, um, been there, there too. It's, it's, it's awful. Yeah. Oh, it totally is. And so I think, you know, so I think there is, there is a, uh, you know, that negotiation it's there's, there's a, a matter of safety to take into account. And then there's a matter of, you know, how much are you willing to go against, your social environment, right? I mean, you can't just, when you're like 12, you can't just go, hey, guess what, dad, I'm a girl, and have him go, okay, get the fuck out, mm -hmm. right? I mean, you're 12. Yeah. There, there's, there's, so it's, I mean, it's somewhat of a necessary negotiation. Right. And I think that looking at it as like sort of allow in quotation marks also um, acknowledges that it's not just the speaker's role to, to decide, like, am I going to go into this? Yes. Am I going to rail against right. it? It's also on right. the listener to examine sort of their own prejudices and what society oh. has taught them. Like, yes, for that 12-year-old, like, sure, they may feel some type of way about their kid coming out as trans, but ultimately they are right. the adult. They're the parent. And they need to recognize that their primary job is keeping their kids safe, regardless of how they feel about that kid. Right, right. Yeah, I'm, I'm, it's very heartbreaking, I guess, to see. So I'm, I'm part of a, a mentorship program. Um, mm. I don't know how much they want me to mention it, so I won't. But part of a mentorship program, and one of the mentors I've worked with, or mentees I've worked with, lives in Florida. Mm -hmm. And like now all of a sudden, there's just, I mean, there's just, there's nothing for her to do. And, and it's, yeah, it's other people they're like, well, hey, this is what we think of you. Yeah. And and so, you know, sort of suck it up. Mm -mm. And you, to a certain extent, you know, you can sort of say, well, hey, just move somewhere else. But when you're 12, yeah, you know, the, the idea that like, oh, if you don't like this country or this state, then get out is like <laughs> right, so yes. overly simplistic. It drives me up the wall when I see someone saying that. It's like, you know, that's not a viable answer. It's just your cool little right. shut down. Like, great. Right, right. I'd always I always look. I don't think it's really possible, <laughs> but I'd love to sort of turn that around because, you know, they, they go, oh, my God, you get people who go, oh, gosh, I can't take all these, you know, all the horrible purple haired bents walking around <laughs> wherever the hell I am. <laughs> and, it, you know, I'd love to say, you know what, why don't you move somewhere else? Yeah, because because, you know, I because <laughs> I got like like a house here and I live here. And right. You can't just uproot everything and, and change. Everything yeah. About yourself. Yeah. So in any event, that's <laughs> far afield. Um, though, I, you know, I want to, there's an aspect, because like pronouns, we, you know, I spoke about pronouns earlier. We, we, you know, we've gone through, you know, there's a sense of consideration uh, with the social environment. You know, the social environment absolutely ought to respect it. 
And yet, as you mentioned, it's it's really a choice, mm-hmm. right, for for the social environment to accept or reject, you know, whatever it is you want to express. Um, I want to ask you, I mean, as, a, as somebody who focuses on communication, like how how are pronouns why are pronouns so important? How do they how do they really play into communication? Sure, uh, I, I think that you know pronouns are uh, uh, essential for communication. Uh, you know, and especially in terms of including the pronouns of I and you. Right, we got to talk about ourselves and and the person that we're talking about, <laughs> but right. also how we refer to ourselves. At, at least and, ourselves. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. I, I want to at least talk about me. Yeah, you come know, on now. Um, but it's also how we refer to other people when they're not present or when we're talking about them. And it is, you know, a, a clear sign of respect to use uh, people's pronouns. Um, it's also a sign of just sort of where our society is at overall. Um, mm-hmm. I know that as a person that uses they, them pronouns and feels very connected to they, them in general, um, it's... <laughs> content warning for for other folks that use they them currently i don't know maybe skip forward a little bit but um as a person that uses they them pronouns it is highly unlikely that in the near future i will be just gendered correctly based on appearance right sure Uh, sure. because they them pronoun usage is still considered novel and and new and not at the forefront of our society's minds and just not gendering Mm -hmm. other people um, and I see, you know, clients that say, you know, getting gendered as they, them is, you know, dysphoria triggering for them as well. Um, oh, interesting. Yeah. But, uh, you know, from my perspective, I'm like, God, I wish everyone gendered everyone as they, them until they knew the person's pronouns. Cause that sure. seems like the most neutral option until you know better. Um, so I kind of danced around the question, but like, I, Again, it's sort of that contract of or, or negotiation, rather, of like interpersonal relationships and how viewing each other is is impacted by sort of the the cultural exposure that we've had thus far. Right, right. So I know there actually there are many languages, but Hungarian in particular, mm-hmm. I know I know that Hungarian does not doesn't really have he, she, does not have he, she at all. Mm. Everything is in, is in it. And I think actually none of the nouns, um, I think none of the nouns have a, a gender to them. I'm, I'm Love that. a little unsure. Yeah, it's a Finno-Ugrian language, so not a romantic language. Okay. Um, I, I'm curious, you know, I wish we could, this is, this is me just rambling a bit, but I wish English could, could do something like that. I mean, I was very young when I remember hearing, I think it was Zizé, I think was were the original ones. I mean, yeah, 70s, I think, maybe early 80s, that I remember hearing, here are some, some gender-neutral pronouns. And, you know, the, there were the standard people going, why in the flying hell do we need these? Yeah. And I thought the same, because I'm like... Right. B- because to me, like, j- my gender was so... in internalized and I'm thinking you know is pretty young maybe a teenager mm-hmm. um, but my gender was pretty internalized I realized my physicality was was wrong let me use the quotation marks again my physicality was wrong but I knew what my gender was and so I, it's you know I thought well why wouldn't you just call me she even though everybody called me you know he mm. they were wrong but so I told you I was rambling and I did so I wish I wish we could do that. These are not like a gender neutral pronoun has been in in use for 40 years, you know, running on 50 years, maybe longer. I don't I mean, when I heard about it, it was in the, the early 80s. So absolutely. I think and I think I think we can and, you know, we can see historical records of like the first use of like uh single person they going back to like what the 13th century like older than like that. the letter yeah. uh the the letter that we don't use anymore was still in usage mm-hmm. like and okay. we see that do and z from you know germanic become thou and the in old in middle mm-hmm. english and then becomes you know you and you in common english uh, modern right. English, 
Uh, so language definitely does evolve over time. And I think with more exposure and understanding, like that's really what it comes down to, understanding and empathy. Yeah. I think we can right, make these right. changes. It's just people have to want that and see that it's warranted. Right, right. Yeah, because my opinion is, you know, I think they and them are very loaded terms mm. and very it, interestingly. So I think they are triggering. I think when yeah. when you get somebody who's very against, I suppose, the usage of, of you know, because we have the masculine neuter in, in pronoun in in English and I wish we could, if we, if we got away with, if we got away with, from the masculine neuter and if we got away with, with they, them and used something that was truly a new word, like, I feel that would help. I think that, that, I don't know, maybe, maybe I'm very naive. I know I'm very naive, but <laughs> we all are I'd, in our own ways. <laughs> sure. But I'd love to see people who go, I, what the hell? One person is not a they. And it's like, can one person be a Zay? Mm -hmm. Like a Z? Yeah. Uh, you know, is he or is it, you know, and, and I'd love to have that conversation have that person go, uh, yeah, I guess so. It was he, he, she, and Z. Yeah. I guess I can do that. You know, I'm curious, you know, absolutely. His, her and his, her and Zare. I don't know. And I think, I, cause go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. No, no, go <laughs> ahead. <laughs> Uh, just, you know, and, and I think, you know, if that's their mindset, then then in this hypothetical, I I can only assume that they'll come up with a reason to not use Z and be like, well, it wasn't a pronoun given from the pronoun tree, you know, um, of course, always. Of course. But um, yeah, and I think that's the purpose behind neo pronouns or, or you know, mm -hmm. a large piece of it is is people not wanting to use they them or or wanting to find new terms to invent themselves and, and imagine themselves yes. and bring that into being. Yes. Uh, right. Really right. cool stuff. Uh, and also very intimidating mm -hmm. and I need more practice with them. <laughs> well, I hear that. Yeah. yeah. Cause I mean, I will tell you like there was nothing. I mean, this is my own experience. The first time I was called somebody's wife, the first time I was called, Oh, I'm going to end up crying. The first time I heard one of my sisters call me sister, mm was so empowering, so, I, I, I can't, like, I don't even, it's like I expanded, you know, I felt like the Grinch, only, like, my whole body grew three sizes that day. <laughs> yes, right. <laughs> Ended up breaking out of the little box and everything. <laughs> you know, there was the little Amethysta box, and then suddenly the thing went, <laughs> I, was out, I was all out. Um, I've got to figure, you know, if we had something that, that because, uh, frankly, I don't, like, I wouldn't, I don't, I'm going to say this and I'm going to qualify it. So let me, I don't want to call you they, I want to call you something that refers to you in particular mm. because they refers to something else. Like right now she does not. And, and I, and I can own that, but they can mean you or it can mean a group of weird conservatives down the road with a little flag, you know, Confederate flag flying behind their truck. Absolutely. I, I would love to give you the respect that that is only you. If that makes sense. I think it, I so. think it does make sense outside of the perspective of someone who does use they them pronouns because for me like that is respectful. Um, mm -hmm. I think that words can have multiple meanings and and multiple contexts that we use it for. Right. Um, right. Just like in the word literally, right? Based on context, we know if they're <laughs> yes. actually speaking literally or if they're using it as hyperbole to emphasize just how intense, like whatever it is they're talking about is. Yes, right. Um, so we'll that. I, I think that, um, yeah, I think, and, and I think that also you as sort of a single person or what's the word? Um, yeah, single third person uh pronoun is also used to refer to a collective group of people. Um, it's a good point. Which is All also right, confusing point. and why I love the Southern y'all. Like that fills in <laughs> that niche rather nicely. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess that's and, sort of and, what you're saying is like having sort of a separate word that naturally sort of occurs that can mean a single like yes. non-binary person. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I, I did appreciate too, because in, in the Southern English you have y'all. And then if you're going to refer to a group of people, it's all of y'all. All y'all. Right? Absolutely. <laughs> Love that. <laughs> all of y'all. 
Georgia, there were bits that I appreciated for what it's worth. <laughs> Sweet potato pie was another. Oof. Oh, my gosh. Don't get me started. Holy we're coming cats. up on the fall. Oh, I, I can't know. wait. Yeah, right? <laughs> send, send me one, will you? Um, <laughs> I'm sure it'll be beautiful by the time it gets there to Colorado. <laughs> I'm sure. So there was a question that was asked of me. Um, and I see I didn't send I didn't put it on the agenda that I sent to you. Ooh. Fabulous. There was a question. Sorry. No, you're fine. There was a question that was sent to me that was a that you know tapped into what I was trying to say last week. The idea of um, you know understanding of gender outside of of you know people who feel it acutely, such as such as me, such as you. Um, and the question actually started with dress sizes, which is mm. kind of fun. Um, in fact, it's actually, it's my friend, Nani Hurley. I, I interviewed her a few weeks back and hey, hi, Nani. Um, I should probably remember what the hell she said. Oh, so she had said dress sizes. There were, there were, um, there was a conversation around, you know, should, should larger dress sizes be in, in shops? She's in Ireland. Um, I don't know why I had to say that, but there, you know, whether or not larger dress sizes should be. And, and the consensus was, look, if you're thin, you should have no say in this matter. I hope I'm re representing this well, because you don't understand what it's like to need a larger dress size. I certainly do. But the, the, the question that she asked was, what if we turn this toward gender? Can cisgender people, are they allowed to talk about gender if they don't perceive it very acutely or if they yeah, let me stop with that. Mm -hmm. What is what is your thought there? Are cisgender people allowed to talk about gender? No. Yeah, no, of course they are. Uh, oh, no. Shit. <laughs> Can you imagine? I was like, oh, I was going to go well, dang. Just flipping the table on you. Um, no, I think um, absolutely. I think, I mean, cisgender people experience gender as well. And, and there's no perspectives that should be, you know, completely... Um, cast out other than, you know, specifically harmful ones. Um, sure, sure. And I think, you know, there there are also cisgender people who go through... I think the reason that that I, I sometimes treat cis folks with, with, like, a little bit of hesitancy and caution is because it's not as clear-cut that they've gone through a reflection process of being questioned Agreed. what they're told. Um, right. And I think there, thankfully, nowadays, there are a, a lot of cisgender people who are starting to ask these questions and sort of reflect on themselves. And if they ultimately mm -hmm. find out that they're cisgender, awesome, great, you figured out more about yourself. Like, that's a beautiful thing. Yeah. Yes, um, yes. And I think that, uh, you know, I, and gender is also not a, an immutable thing. Like, if we close off cisgender people from being able to have some discussions, um, we are also cutting out people who are questioning their identity who say, well, I don't really know right. where I fall, but this is what I've been told that I am. So I, I'm sticking with this for now. Right. And there needs right. to be that gray area so that people can explore these spaces and sort of be in a liberated mm -hmm. space where they can uh, examine themselves and each other. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Think of gender as a universal experience. Yeah. You know, we, we all have to negotiate for some people. The negotiations are very easy, very straightforward. For some, Love that for yeah, them. For some people. Yeah. <laughs> right. I'm so happy for you out there. <laughs> if your negotiations were easy, mine were a little bit more complicated, but that doesn't mean that you did not have to, to go through the negotiations. So definitely you once used a, a term with me, um, once used, I'm ma it's making it sound like we've had a relationship that went back How to like, How many years you know, ago was this? Yeah. Do you remember we were lingering over brandy on the <laughs> scene and you brought up to me. <laughs> on the veranda. Go on. <laughs> exactly. When we were, when we were taking a holiday in Paris <laughs> in the sixties, you know, um, do you once brought up the word microaggressions and I, and I, I have a sense of what you mean by that, but I'd love to hear, you know, more, more, um, I want to hear it from you. Let me, let me, let me make sure I understand you. Oh, sure. Um, so and do you, do you want the more context or do you, cause you use the word to say cisgen, uh, uh, microaggressions from cisgender people toward, um, transgender or non-binary. Mm, mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, I mean, microaggressions, I feel like are, uh, <sighs> 
it's it's hard to pin down in a nice little soundbite, um, especially mm-hmm. by someone on the on the outside of women's and gender studies. But <laughs> um, as far as I understand them and, and sort of use that term myself, um, I think that they are subtle reminders from a conversation partner uh, that the the speaker is is other is is something different. I see. Um, Understood. So, you know, misgendering people, even if it's, you know, occurs from someone who, who means well, like that mm-hmm. is a reminder of like, oh, okay, so, so I'm not seen as, as what I am. Um, right. Even if it's like from someone who's a, a, like a lovely person and, and made a mistake, like, it's still like, ah, mm, okay. Uh, just one of those tiny little cuts that add to the thousand cuts. Um, sure. That may not be okay. seem as big to other people, but over time and, and as those cuts add up, they start to weigh more and more heavily on the person being cut. Right. Right. Okay. Because I, I mean, I, I looked at those, the, the, when somebody makes an honest mistake and, you know, during the course of transition, you know, it would happen pretty, with me for sure. Cause my hair was growing out. Mm-hmm. I was learning what I wanted to look like, you know, who, how I wanted to look. And I, you know, there were a few times, several, okay, more than I want to count. <laughs> Let me move on. When, you know, the, the, when I would be misgendered. Now, I think that there were people, you know, there's a certain assumption and I was okay with people who made mistakes. Absolutely. Because, Sometimes you don't know. Yeah, you know. I'll make mistakes. Um, yeah, like I'm, o- I'm okay with that. I, o- I did, however, get, and so I don't. So I guess my point was I didn't consider those as as microaggressions, or I didn't consider it as a as aggression because I thought you know if I don't present in a way that gives you a clear sense, I understand if you don't know. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I'll understand that. I didn't like it, but uh, you know, I'll give you the benefit of of you know. You're just trying to be respectful when you call me whatever. Um, I did, however, receive an email at one point that used not only my dead name, but then misgendered me through like three or four times in the email. And I'm like, you know very well mm. who I, you didn't even use my legal name. Like that was aggression, yeah. you know, and my, and my claws came out then. You know, when when I say, hey, what do I do with this coffee cup? And says, you know, well, just put in the thing behind you, sir. I was like, well, did mm-hmm. she, 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 never mind. Yeah. You know, um, but that was pissing, that pissed me off. I'm like, what are you doing? So I turned that into a big, long story about me. That's, that's. That's different. So I'm talking about two different things. You know, microaggressions are, are somewhat purposeful then. I mean, they, they, I think, am I getting that right? I think at least uh, that one that you mentioned, I would consider that a macro aggression of Mm. like someone specifically doing something to hurt someone else. Oh yeah. Um, Microaggressions I feel like are are trickier and I feel like he did call it love. Yeah. He said it was, he was giving it in a sense of love. And I'm like, I think you want to look up that term before you use it. Miriam Webster defines love as (laughs) like, um, (laughs) But yeah, I think I think microaggressions are are subtler and not always intentional, um, yeah. which is is tricky. And I and I think it's you know complicated by the word aggression, which you sort of like honed in on, as well. Right. Um, right. I think it it might be helpful to look at it as not aggression from like an individual perspective, but aggression oh, from a societal perspective uh, of yes. like. This person Got has it. been told this over and over and over again. So this is how they view the right. world. And so it's just their worldview. Um, yeah. Not intended okay. with malice, but it does hurt. And there's that impact, even regardless of intent. Mm-hmm. Oh, sure. Sure. Yeah. Because I've also had conversations where somebody said, well, you know, women have it slightly different. And I'm like, hmm. <laughs> okay. Yeah. 
I'm not one of them. Okay, that's cool. From yeah. a woman. I mean, it's what I mean to say that, you know, that a woman has said, well, you know, just, you, you know, women have it slightly different. And I'm kind of like, oh, well, that, Terrible. that was excluded. Yeah. That made me feel bad. It's like you could easily just so, say, like, cis women have it different if that's ultimately what you're trying to get around to. Yeah. And ultimately there, I yes. think there's some negotiation and conversation to be had there of like, well, let's talk right. about that. But like, right. if that's what right. you mean, then just say it. Because there's no doubt that the transgender women, and you know, I mean, even if I just go with, what if I just say people who were assigned male at birth, who act in an effeminate manner, there are definitely, that's definitely hard, you mm-hmm. know, that's hard to grow up with. So, you know, it, it doesn't even have to just be, you know, cisgender is what I was going to say. So, um, I know I'm running out of time, so I want to ask you one quick, qu- one last quick question here. Do you think it's possible, especially given we went 15 minutes over what I was hoping? So thank you for all of your oh, time. Sure. Do you think it's possible for all of us to understand each other? <laughs> I have to I have to believe <laughs> yes. Right. Like um, if if I if I didn't, then I I don't know, I would I would pull a Henry David Thoreau and go and live by a lake and and have my mom yes. give me sandwiches or whatever his actual story was. It's it's a it's an right, absurd thing. Right. Um but yeah, I think I think we do and I think it's I think it's necessary in order to build like a, a truly functioning society uh for all of us yes. to understand each other. Um because there will always be differences in perspectives. And I think where we get into trouble is where we just discount someone else's perspective because, oh, that's not mine. And so it must be wrong. Um, right. And so, right. like, that's where we get into a lot of problems when we when we see different cultures sort of uh, coming together and having completely different takeaways of an interaction. Um, both of those things can be true. But it it all comes down to sort of subjectivity. There's so much more subjective truth rather than objective truth, I think, in the world. Sure. And oh, sure. So we need all of the perspectives that we can in order to piece together, like, what's happening, what's the best path forward for everyone. Right, right, right. I love that. <laughs> I have to believe it. I have to. Because, like, otherwise, like, what am I what am I even doing here, right? Like, with gender-affirming voice yeah. work. Um right. Sure. Your work, my work, yeah. We may as well just pack it in if there's no, if we can't understand each other. Absolutely. Just pack it up and, and go home. Yeah. I am home. <laughs> Same I, I meant that figuratively. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I literally am at home right now. I, <laughs> Same, though. Um, what version did I use? I don't know. But mm-hmm. go ahead. Sorry. Oh, no. I think, I don't think I had anything really more concrete to, to offer. Just, um, I, I think that you know not understanding each other is is what has resulted in a lot of strife over like yes how many millennia you know um, yeah it's always yeah. us versus them as opposed to like all y'all all y'all together <laughs> yes right right and which I mean there's a little. I mean I understand some you can make comments like that where you go look we're all in this together but. And people go, oh, it's kind of sappy. Yeah. But it's like, but we really, we really are. I mean, you know, if we kill, if we kill each other, we're all dead. Mm-hmm. You know, was possibly not what you wanted. So why don't we try not to kill each other? Absolutely. Yeah. So on that note, listen, I'm- Kevin, thank you so much for coming and joining me. This is, has been a phenomenal conversation. Oh, Hope thank you, you liked it at all. Oh, yeah. No, thank you so much for having me. I, I, I really enjoyed our talk. I think that's why we went on for so long here. Hopefully yeah. you'll be able to cut yeah. it down to something palatable for your audience, but we'll see. I don't even think I'm going to. But, <laughs> um, thank you for all the work that you do. Thank you for the person you are. Just thank you. Thank you for everything. Oh, well, I... You're so welcome. Happy to be myself. Happy to do this work. Uh, right. And thank you so much for, for creating a platform to have these discussions. Oh, it's very important. Sure. Sure. Well, that is it for August 10th, 2023. Once again, if you enjoyed this content, please like the video or the uh, podcast if you're listening to that. And feel free to subscribe to receive new content. Again, my Substack publication will be linked in the show notes. Um, Please subscribe there and help Kevin and me continue this fight for identity and gender. 
being normal aspects of the human experience because yes. we all have it. Absolutely. 